Hello everyone and welcome back. So this whole class has been a combination of algebra and topology. Today we are going to combine algebra and topology in a different way. We're going to look at how groups act on spaces. So I'll define exactly what a group action is, but you've perhaps encountered this before. Groups in some sense are born to act. When a group acts on a vector space, you get something called a representation, which is a great way to study a group. In another vein, you might let a group act on the vertices of a geometric figure by permutations, and you learn about the symmetries of the geometric figure and also about the group itself. So we're going to take this aspect, groups acting on things, and port it into topology. So let's get to it. So, like I mentioned, we're going to be studying group actions. But before that, I want to define a topological group. So a topological group is a group G together with a topology on the underlying set of G. Okay, so I have a group that's a set with an operation, but it's also, it's a set. So I'm gonna pick out some subsets and I'm gonna call them open and I'm gonna ask for my usual arbitrary unions are open and finite intersections are open. So I'm also gonna require some compatibility between the group and the topology We want uh, the maps, I'll call this times from G cross G to G given by, you can imagine what this is, G1, G2 is sent to G1 times G2. And there's also another map, uh, inverse map, this goes from G back to G, and you guessed it, it sends G to its inverse. We want these to be continuous. On the product topology, on the underlying topology. So let me give you some examples of these. So let S1 be a subset of the complex numbers. Uh, so it's Z and the complex numbers with the modulus of Z being equal to one. So recall that such numbers are of the form E to the I theta for some theta in the real numbers. This just tells you what angle you're at in the circle. Okay, uh, so I claim that S1 is a topological group under complex multiplication. Uh, that is e to the i theta 1 times e to the i theta 2 is equal to e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2. So what do I need? I need that S1 cross S1 to S1 given by uh, e to the i theta 1 e to the i theta 2 is sent to e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2 is continuous. So uh, we know what S1 cross S1 is. It's the torus. I'll just give you a, 
a hand wavy argument for why this is. But let me just show you what this map is. So here is one of my S1 factors and I'm going to call this rim right here the other S1 factor. So that this point here is 1 1 that is e to the i 0. So that point, e to the i0 times e to the i0, is, if you just write this in red, mapped right down here to e to the i0. Now, this point here in green, in the first factor, it's e to the i pi over 2. And in the second factor, it's 1. And so it's mapped to the product e to the i pi over 2 times 1. So it's mapped here, e to the i pi over 2. And what I want you to imagine is, imagine interpolating from the red point to the green point. And you can imagine this would interpolate here between the red point and the green point. And that's the hallmark of a continuous map, that small changes in the input give small changes in the output. Let me give you one more point here is another point. So it's a quarter way around each of the circles. So this is e to the i pi over 2, e to the i pi over 2. And it is mapped here to e to the i pi, which of course is equal to negative 1. And again, imagine rotating from this point to that point. you would interpolate between the green point and the purple point on the image circle. So that's my hand wavy argument for the fact that this map from G cross G to G is continuous. Now also, I need inversion to be uh, continuous. So this, this proves product is continuous. Now how about inversion? Inversion is e to the i theta goes to the inverse. That is, it's something that is multiplied by e to the i theta to get back to 1. That is e to the i minus theta. And now what does that do topologically? Well, it just takes a point theta to negative theta. So it's just reflection. So inversion is reflection. So inversion is continuous. And therefore, S1 is a topological group. There are many, many more such examples. Here is one more. So let G, L, N, R be N by N matrices with non-zero determinant. Okay, so before in the S1 case, the topology was obvious. So it was our usual topology on S1. How do I want to topologize G, L, N, R? Well, I'll topologize it as a subspace of R to the N squared, right? This is an N by N matrix. So like one, this is A11 to A1N. I might get my uh, row column notation off, but that's okay. The point here is that there are n squared numbers here, just real numbers. And so that's some subset of Rn squared. And I'll just give it that topology. Now, I won't prove this, but it's not hard to believe that GLNR is a topological group 
under matrix multiplication. And finally, how about just good old groups? What about groups? Okay, uh, like usual groups, like Z, Z mon N, maybe your dihedral group, DN, are also topological groups, but the topology part is trivial we're going to be using the discrete topology. Now, of course, if it's a topological group, the product maps and inversion maps need to be continuous. But this is automatically satisfied for anything with the discrete topology because every map into the discrete topology or out of the discrete topology is continuous. So like I mentioned, groups want to act on things. So how do groups act on spaces? So given a topological group G and a space X, A continuous G action denoted G acts on X is a continuous map from G cross X into X this is usually denoted G and X are sent to G dot X. So that, first of all, the identity map acts trivially for all X and X, where here, again, E is the identity. I'd also like that if I have G H acting on X, this is the same thing as G acting on H acting on X, a natural condition you'd want. You don't want to have to worry about parenthesizing things. Groups are supposed to be associative anyway. So this is capturing that essence. So that's a group action. Let me give you some examples. So let X be a point in the N sphere and define negative X to be the antipodal point. Then Z mod two, which I'll write as the set zero and one, acts on SN by one times X is equal to negative X. Now, what do I need to check? Uh, and of course, let me just explicitly state it. Zero times X, this goes back to X. Uh, one times one times X. So one acting on one acting on X. This is one acting on negative X, which is negative negative X. The antipodal point to the antipodal point is the point itself. So uh, this does satisfy the group hypothesis because this is the same thing as one times one acting on X, which is zero acting on X. <coughs> cool.
Great. So that's our very baseline action. Now, also, S1, let's just write this as a point Z, uh, or rather, Z in the complex numbers so that the modulus of Z is 1, acts on the two torus, which I'll write as ZW, or I already have a Z, let's call it uh, XY and C cross C, so that the modulus of X is equal to the modulus of Y is equal to one. Ah, no, sorry, I don't want, modulus of X is one and the modulus of Y is one. Sorry about that. Okay, what's this action? It's what you would expect. Z acting on X, Y. Well, actually, maybe you expect a couple things. Here's one. Let's just stick it into the first factor. I know that S1 acts on S1 since it's a topological group. Let's have it act on that first factor. So what does this action look like? Well, This action is uh, rotates around the first factor. So it looks like you break everything up into these red circles here. And S1 acts by rotation here. If I act by, for example, the angle pi over 2, it'll send the whole torus curling around itself like this. But there's another action. As you can tell, this is completely symmetric. So it can also act by x and then z times y. And this will rotate around the second factor. So here, I'll have circles filling out like this. And the action takes me around this way. So spins around the other way. And finally, I have also, also, Z acting on X, Y goes to Z times X, Z times Y. And this one looks weird, but it's also maybe the coolest one, I can fill out the torus with these diagonal circles. You can imagine the whole torus can be filled with these circles. And what this action does is pushes you along these green circles. So it does some weird diagonal type thing. Kind of cool. Great. So as we can, the point of all this is that a group can act on a space in many different ways. There isn't a unique group action of a group on a space. Now, here's just an aside which is kind of handy to think about sometimes. So for a fixed G in a group, the map X goes to G acting on X is actually a homeomorphism. Why is this? Well, it's continuous by definition, but also it has 
a continuous inverse, which sends a point x to g inverse acting on x. So yeah, if you act on x by g and then act on x by g inverse, well, let's just go ahead and do this. If I act by g, then I go to g times x. And if I act by g inverse, then I go to g inverse acting on g acting on x. But this is, of course, g inverse g acting on x, which is the identity acting on x, which must be x itself. So I've shown you that, that that's an inverse. The upshot is that a group action gives a group homomorphism from the group into the group of homeomorphisms of a space. It's kind of neat. And you can actually think of group actions as subsets of the homeomorphism group of a given space. All right. So here's the definition. Suppose G acts on a space X. Given a point X and X, we define the orbit of X, little x, to be, well, we'll write it as capital G times X, and it's all of the elements G acting on X for all group elements G in G. Similarly, if U is a subset of X, not necessarily open, but usually it will be, then G times U is, uh, there's a couple ways you could write this. How would I write it like this? It's all of the orbits of the points in U. So the idea is, uh, you know, you have a space X, uh, maybe here is X, here is G1 times X, here is G2 times X, and there's G3 times X, and the green points are the orbit of X. You just follow X around everywhere it goes. And if it was a set, you do the same thing. Here's U, maybe here's G times U. So purple is G times U. Now, this orbit relation is actually an equivalence relation. What do I mean? So we can define an equivalence relation on X by X is related to Y if G times X is equal to G times Y. Another way to think about this is that X is related to Y if there exists a group element G so that G times X is equal to Y. So it's not hard to see that this is an equivalence relation. X is related to itself by the identity map. If X is related to Y by G, then G inverse takes you backwards and you can, if X is related to Y by G1 and Y is related to Z by G2, then G1, G2, or G2, G1 takes you from X to Z. So 
What do we like to do with equivalence relations? Take quotients. So here's a definition. So given a group action, G acting on X, X mod G is the quotient space X mod twiddle, where this is the relation above, X is related to Y if G times X is equal to G times Y. Now, uh, this is a, maybe a point of confusion, but the notation X mod G doesn't contain anything about the group action itself, but usually this will be understood. So note that we can call the points in X mod G, like G times X for some representative X. Like usually you can always call things by their equivalence classes. That's all I'm saying here. Okay, let's see some examples of these quotients. So like we saw before, if Z mod 2Z acts on S2 by the antipodal map, then S2 mod Z mod 2Z, right, Z2, uh, well, okay, I take each point and I'm going to identify it with all of its orbits under Z mod 2. There's exactly one other point, and it's the antipodal point. So here's X, and here's one acting on X, and here's Y, and here's one acting on Y. We've seen this before. What happens when you identify antipodal points on S2? You get RP2. Great, so that's a, an example we know and love. Here's another example. Let Z act on R by N, so this is in Z, times R, this is in R, is equal to N plus R. So this action just takes a real number and shifts it over by that integer amount. Okay, so let's look at the orbits here. So here's R, here's zero, one, two. Well, the integers actually form an orbit, right? So here is uh, like zero acting on zero. Here is one acting on zero. Here is two acting on zero. And also, sort of like the half integers. So here's zero acting on one half. Here is one acting on one half. And out here would be two acting on one half. So every point can actually be represented by some point between zero and one, but zero and one are identified. So R mod Z is equal to, okay, so like I said, all the points are somewhere between zero and one. We pick out that representative, but zero is related to one. And we've seen this before. This is exactly S1. Great. So here's something to notice. Pi one of RP two we've seen is Z mod two. And Pi one of S1 is Z. These are the groups 
that are acting on our spaces. So this is not a coincidence, but these group actions had a special property which we'll need to make precise. And here it is. An action, G acting on X, is properly discontinuous if every point in X has a neighborhood U so that U intersect G acting on U is equal to the empty set for all G and G, which are of course not the identity. So, I mean, the picture I think is pretty clear. Uh, just this action should move the sets completely off of themselves. No overlaps, right? Uh, here's just a word of caution. There are many definitions of properly discontinuous in different books. So that's the definition I wrote here is the one we're going to work with. Uh, and also this term is horrible because all of our group actions are still going to be continuous. Everything is continuous. The word is just called properly discontinuous. That's how it is. So here is the deeper connection between group actions and the fundamental group. So let's suppose that G acts on Y properly discontinuously. With Y path connected and locally path connected. Then, first of all, the map y to y mod g, given by, it's, it's the normal quotient map, p of y is g acting on y, like the orbit of y under g. This is a normal covering map. Also, this group G, it's acting somewhere up here on Y. How is it acting? Well, it acts by the group of deck transformations. And finally, G is isomorphic to pi one of Y mod G mod P star of pi one of Y. So in particular, If Y is simply connected, then Pi one of Y mod G is equal to G. So I want to say that this last proposition, we may not apply it too much in this class, but in higher level algebraic topology, it gets used all the time. If you want to know the fundamental group of a space, 
A lot of times what you'll do is find some simply connected space, Y, and try to find some group action on there so that you get your original space downstairs. All right, so let's prove it. So first of all, let's cover Y by sets that we have this properly discontinuous assumption. So U alpha, so that G times U intersect U is equal to the empty set for all U in U alpha and G and G with little g not equal to the identity. So the first thing we want to prove is that this map here is a normal covering map. Uh, now, for all, G and G, G times U is homeomorphic to U. And this is a trick we've seen before. Since G inverse is the inverse map. Okay, so let me just start drawing a picture here, a very suggestive picture. I have a couple sets here. U, G1 times U, be G2 times U, and they're all homeomorphic. So, for example, these two sets are homeo by the map G, or G1. And that homeo goes this way. Uh, so this is one of the requirements of a covering space, right? Now, the quotient map, P from Y to Y mod G, simply identifies all of these sets to a single copy, capital G times U, And by the definition of quotient topology, G times U is homeomorphic to U itself. So down here I have a map P, and here is G times U. And so, you know, as a set, it's exactly equal to U. Moreover, if any set is open down here, it must exactly be the case that it's open all of the way upstairs. So these are two, like, they're the same set and they have the same topology on them. So this is a local homeomorphism. So P is a local homeo on these sets. So it is a covering map. These properly discontinuous sets serve as the evenly covered neighborhoods. Now, the next claim is that G acts by deck transformations. I'll sort of um, wave my hands here a little bit. G acts by deck transformations So, well, first of all, G acts by homeomorphisms. This is again, every action by G has this inverse action by G inverse. Now, the other condition I need for it to be a deck transformation is that it preserves fibers, but of course it does.
So and it preserves fibers. Let me just remind you why this is like the points above a fiber X are exactly what, what used to be my old X. So this is really like G dot X downstairs. And I had a point X and like G one times X and G two times X, G three times X. This is going to be all of the group elements acting on X sitting right above here. And of course, if I hit any of these with like say G1, this will like take me up here to G1 times X. And maybe uh, like G1 squared is three, G3. Uh, the point is that it's going to keep me within this fiber. And finally, our last claim, that is, scroll up here, that G is isomorphic to the fundamental group mod the image of the fundamental group of the cover is just true in general. So this is true in general for normal coverings. We proved this last time. Great, so now we have this intimate connection between group actions and covering spaces. Let's use it a little bit in some very nice geometric examples. Let's say we're finding some covers. Uh, here's an example. The genus five surface is a fourfold cover of the genus two surface. If you just came up to me and told me this on the street, I wouldn't believe you. But let me draw you a picture here and convince you using group actions. Here's a nice symmetric picture of the genus five surface. One genus in the middle and four genera all around here. Let me also just uh, draw in some lines, circles. Now, there is an action of Z mod four here. So Z mod four acts on the genus five surface, sigma five, by rotation of one fourth. So that rotation is the action of one. And you can see if I do the, the rotation four times, I come back to where I started. And that's basically the requirement of a group action. So what is Sigma five mod this action of Z mod four. Well, we do our usual thing. Every, every one of these, uh, like in between any of the two red circles, uh, <laughs> this blue bit here is homeomorphic to this blue bit here. And moreover, the group action takes me from the blue bit on the left to the blue bit on the right. And all of them can be identified with just this 
sort of torus looking thing on the bottom. So if I mod this out by Z mod four, this is like I have this red circle on the boundary here, this red circle on the boundary here, and I'll have a little bit of stuff down here. So everyone lives somewhere on this piece, but of course the group action takes this circle to this circle. So these need to be identified. And when I identify them, what I get is something that looks like like this. So now I basically grab those two red circles and join them together at the top there. And this you can see is the genus two surface. Okay, so what do we learn from this? So first of all, the fundamental group of the uh, genus five surface is a normal subgroup of the fundamental group of the genus two surface. This is a properly discontinuous action. And like we said, this gives rise to a normal covering and normal coverings correspond to normal subgroups. Cool. What do you do with normal subgroups? You take the quotients. And if I take the quotient here, pi one of sigma two divided by pi one of sigma five, I get the group that's acting upstairs. So I get Z mod four. And it's usually interesting to find abelian quotients of a group. They can sometimes let you get your hands on things. Here, uh, you know, the groups are relatively straightforward, but uh, nevertheless, this can help. Let me give you a, another example, a little more hand wavy this time. Let S3 in R4, I'll just let R4 be C2. So yeah, Sn sits inside of Rn plus one. It's the norm one elements inside of Rn plus one, right? Now if I consider R like an even Rn as C2, I can also write my sphere in a nice way. It looks like Z1, Z2 is in C2, so that the modulus of Z1 squared plus the modulus of Z2 squared is equal to one. If you just write this out in coordinates, you'll see it exactly means X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared plus W squared is equal to one. Okay, so that's a, a way to understand S3. And the reason we want to understand it like this is because complex multiplication is a great way of generating group actions. So Z mod P acts on S3 freely and properly discontinuously by Okay, one acting on a point Z1, Z2 is e to the two pi i times q over p, Z1, e to the two pi i Q over P, Z, two. This looks a little bit complicated, but I'm just rotating both of these factors here. 
If I multiply by e to the 2 pi i times well, e to the anything, uh, I'm not changing the norm of this complex number. And finally, if I do this action p times, then that p in the denominator is going to cancel out. And what I'm going to get is e to some multiple of 2 pi. And so I get back to the identity. So this is an honest group action. Now, the space S3 mod Z mod P is called the lens space L, P, Q. So my P and my Q are coming from this definition over here. And I'll conclude today's class with an interesting fact that we won't prove because it's very difficult. Oh, <laughs> interesting fact. The spaces L71 and L72 are homotopy equivalent but not homeomorphic. So these were some of the first manifolds which were discovered to have this property. Before it wasn't really known how different homotopy equivalence and homeomorphism was, and this was a fine sieve that helped us pick them apart. So that's gonna do it for today. Uh, next class, we are going to venture into the realm of knot theory. This is, I think, going to be a fun little venture and we'll learn how to use our tools, the fundamental group, namely, to distinguish between knotted objects in three-dimensional space. I'm looking forward to it and I'll see you next time.